Hi, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about this work where we looked at enabling the fundamental cacheability of distributed deep learning workloads by designing a system which we call Shade. This work was done in collaboration with my colleagues Ahmed, Yuchi, Arna, Bo, Shun, Yue, and my advisor, Ali. What has been happening in the last couple of years is that there is deep learning everywhere. Deep learning is being used in, bio, in designing biotechnical systems, medical research, smart cities, autonomous vehicles, and many more. Everywhere we look, there is a plethora of applications that are using deep learning. Uh, it is a good thing, though, as it is making our lives easier. I mean, chat GPT could have helped me in making this presentation better, right? <laughs> uh, on the positive side, this is a growing market, and the market is expected to reach $12 billion within a couple of years. And not only that, it is expected to grow at 19% annually for the foreseeable future. However, this is not going to come free. You see, running a deep learning workload requires processing huge amounts of data, so it is data intensive. And you need to do lots of computations as well, so it is compute intensive. To address this, more and more people have counted on using accelerators such as GPUs to speed these things up. What happens is that we end up in an environment where the application needs and the system needs need to be matched to have an optimized performance. To better understand why this is a challenge, let's look at how deep learning work works in a distributed setting, uh, in a data parallel setting, which is the most common form of distributed deep learning and hence is the focus of our work. What you are seeing here are two distributed training nodes which fetch data from a remote storage. And each training node has a local copy of the deep learning model which is going to be used for training. At the beginning of an epoch, which is one iteration throughout the entire data set, each node fetches a chunk of the entire data set. And such chunks are processed in partitions known as mini batches. The training processes coordinate with one another to update the model. Updating the model involves doing many computations uh, which, which make changes to the model parameters to predict cats, dogs, and even weather balloons flying in the sky. Now this update to the model is done based on a loss function which denotes the difference between the predictive value and the actual value of a data sample. And this process of updating the model is known as training the model. Now this, in this whole workflow, one of the key things that matters to us is that deep learning takes time because the data storage impacts the performance of deep learning applications. In fact, it takes around 85 to 90% of the total training time to fetch the data from the remote storage. Now, if we could solve this IO bottleneck, then we could make deep learning remarkably faster. So the real question is, what can we do to solve this IO bottleneck? Well, since, storing, uh, since fetching the data from the remote storage is taking up a lot of time, let's maybe store the entire data set locally. But could this lead to any problems? Well, it turns out it does. Firstly, deep learning is conducted using GPUs, and these GPUs are expensive. And hence, deep learning applications are run using GPU spot VMs. But the thing is that these GPU spot VMs are preemptive, meaning that they can be terminated at any time. And as a result, this would lead to the loss of local storage state. And this is problematic because when we lose the local storage state, we need to download the entire training data set again and again. And these training data sets are large, spanning terabytes. And the second thing is that RAM is expensive, and he hence they are small in size. And these are insufficient to store large training data sets. <laughs> OK, so we cannot get rid of the remote storage. But there is another old technique that we could use. And this is our friend caching. And in this case, our goal would be to improve the performance using a small working set size. But I mean, caching could be a solution, but caching DL workloads is non-trivial because data samples are fetched randomly, which is not amenable to caching. To make matters worse, all of the samples are accessed every epoch. So which samples should we even cache? 
Well, turns out that not sa all samples are equal in DL training. Some of the samples are more important than others as they contribute more towards increasing the accuracy of the deep learning model. So maybe we could catch these important samples, but first, what does it even mean by contributing the most towards increasing the accuracy of a model? To better understand that, let's look at this example of text recognition on the feminist data set. As you can see, samples one, two, and three, those are very easy to understand. But as for samples four and five, a deep learning model might mistakenly assume them to be a C instead of an E and T. So training more on these hard to learn samples can lead to faster accuracy convergence. And hence these hard to learn samples are known as important samples. And since important sampling trains more on these hard to learn samples, there are some repetitions in the data sample access pattern. For example, here in this figure, this figure shows the data sample access pattern we obtained when we trained the ResNet 18 model on the Cypher 10 data set. And as you can see here, some of the samples have been accessed more than once. The x-axis denotes the sample index number and the y-axis denotes the number of times the sample has been accessed. In particular, 26% samples has been accessed more than once and 10% of the samples have been accessed more than three times. This leads us to the key insight of shade that DL training can treat different samples differently. So if we can predict those IO accesses, we can cache those samples, and thus we can fundamentally improve the IO efficiency. But making, this, uh, making, making important samples cacheable is challenging because it involves identifying importance in fine granularity, avoiding making the model biased, and tracking important scores. And I will be discussing these uh, challenges next. The first challenge is that import, these important scores are generally coarse grained, meaning that the same importance or the loss value is assigned to all of the samples in a mini batch. So for example, if we consider four, five, and six to be a, a single mini batch, then at the end of an iteration, all of them will be assigned the same importance score of 0 0.4. But this is not accurate because individual samples have their own contribution towards increasing the accuracy of the model. Then comparison of the importance of these scores across mini batches becomes difficult. So assume we have these two mini batches, B1 and B2, where samples five and eight are the most important. Now, if we were to use a priority queue-based cache to cache the important samples, then sample five would end up in the lower half of the queue after sorting. But this is problematic because sample five was the most important in B1. Ideally, what we would want is that both sample five and eight would be at the top of the queue as they're the most important in their respective mini batches. The second challenge is the challenge of making model biased with repetitive, with repetitive samples. So since important sampling trains more on these hard to learn samples, why don't we keep those hard to sam learn samples in the cache and then just repeat them endlessly to get more hits? Uh, okay, but let's wait for a second here. If we keep repeating the samples again and again and keep training on them, we'd make the model biased and that would lead to accuracy degradation. So there needs to be a balance here. The third challenge is that these important scores are constantly changing, meaning that the, all the samples will not have the same importance throughout the training. So as in we have this mini batch where samples seven and eight are the most important currently, and hence we put seven and eight in the cache. But assume that in the future, the sample scores changes and now seven and eight are not the most important. In, uh, rather, six and nine are the, more, uh, are the most important. So if that happens, our cache ends up with samples which are not the most important. So we need some sort of technique to keep the cache updated. Shade adopts four techniques to address these challenges, which are loss decomposition, rank-based importance scores, the patch sampling policy, and the app cache. Next, I will discuss how Shade utilizes these four techniques to make important samples amenable to caching. To address the first challenge of the coarse grained nature of important uh, samples, Shade adopts a loss decomposition technique, meaning that the, it separates the individual loss of the samples to understand the importance of each sample. 
and then it uses the per sample loss for important sampling and the batch based loss for training. And to adapt the importance scores for priority based caching, Shade ranks the importance scores. So now, when five and eight are the most important in mini batches B1 and B2, after ranking them, both five and eight would end up in the top of the queue rather than in the bottom. To make important scores uh, <clears throat> unbiased, to make the model unbiased, it adapts the sampling based on the loss and accuracy change. So in this case, it would first create a sample slit list with repetitions, and here higher repetitions means higher importance, and then it would send this optimal list for training and caching. So here, it would create an optimal list of samples three, five, and two, so that samples three and five could be cached to get a hit rate of 80%. And in this way, Shade increases the hit rate at will by keeping the accuracy improvement in check. To address the constant change, the challenge of the constant change of importance scores and to keep the most important samples in cache, Shade adopts the app cache policy. In this case, the app cache maintains two queues, PQ and the ghost cache. The PQ tracks the metadata of the importance of all uh, cache samples, and the ghost cache tracks the metadata of the importance of all trained samples. And then by comparing the importance of a cache sample with that of an incoming sample during training, Shade manages to keep the most important samples in cache. The shade architecture consists of two layers, the control layer and the data layer. The control layer finds fine-grained importance, ranks them, and samples them. And the data layer stores and retrieves the samples from the cache and updates the cache using the app cache policy. And further details regarding shade architecture and its techniques can be found in the paper. Shade consists of mainly four components, the shade dataset, the shade sampler, the shade training process, and the analysis framework. The shade dataset uses contains the app cache logic, and it has the logic for communicating with the in-memory pooled cache, which is a Redis KV store in our case. The shade sampler communicates with the training APIs, and it has the logic for the patch sampling policy. And the shade training process has the other two techniques, loss decomposition and ranking logic. We also have a built-in analysis framework to facilitate experimentation and analysis. Shade is incredibly easy to deploy and use. For example, a pseudocode for training would only require minor change to that used in PyTorch. Instead of the dataset and the samplers used in PyTorch, we would need to use the shade dataset and the shade sampler. To evaluate shade, we built a cluster of four nodes, each having two GPUs on the Chameleon Cloud. For our remote storage, we use a HDD-based NFS server. We evaluate shade against LRU incorporated distributed training in PyTorch on the ImageNet and the Cypher 10 dataset using four models, AlexNet, ResNet 18, ResNet 50, and VGGNet. We evaluate shade based on four metrics, the improvement of accuracy over time, the increase in throughput, the increase in hit ratio, and the mini batch, uh, improvement in mini batch load time. In this talk, I will only be covering the first three, and the improvement in mini batch load time can be found in the paper. At first, let's look at how the accuracy improves over time over shade against LRU incorporated distributed training in PyTorch, uh, which we call the baseline. The percentages here denote the working set sizes or the amount of data set cached by the different policies. And this figure shows the accuracy versus time plot we obtained when we trained the ResNet 50 model on the ImageNet data set. We can observe that Shade, while caching just 10% of the dataset, manages to reach accuracy convergence 1.7 times faster compared to the baseline at the same working set size. Again, when, Shade is, uh, when, the, when we increase the percentage of cache dataset to 75%, Shade manages to reach accuracy convergence 3.3 times faster compared to the baseline at the same working set size. When we train another model, AlexNet, on the Cypher 10 dataset, we observe similar performance improvement. In this case, Shade, while caching 10% of the dataset, manages to reach accuracy convergence 3.3 times faster compared to the baseline at the same working set size. What's interesting to note here is that Shade, while caching just 10% of the dataset, manages to reach accuracy convergence uh, faster compared to the baseline, even when the baseline is caching 75% of the dataset, meaning that the baseline is caching 7.5 times more data compared to Shade. And this shows us that even if a larger portion of the data set is cached, naively caching data samples without proper techniques to exploit the data locality 
does not always lead to better performance. And as Shade can properly exploit data locality, it can quickly train a model and reach accuracy convergence faster using a limited cache space. Next, we look at the impact of Shade policies on the throughput of a DL training job. And this figure here shows the throughput that we obtained when we trained the AlexNet model on the Cypher 10 dataset. We observed that Shade, while caching just 10% of the dataset, manages to have a 2.3 times higher throughput compared to the baseline at the same working set size. And the interesting thing here is Shade, while caching just 10% of the dataset, manages to have, a, have the same throughput compared to the baseline, even when the baseline is caching 75% of the dataset. Seven, that means that it is caching 7.5 times more data compared to Shade. And this is because Shade can process images quickly by fetching repeated samples from the cache, and this leads to a decrease in the overall training time. Finally, we evaluate the heat rate of Shade compared to the emulated versions of two state-of-the-art caching policies, which are Cordial and Quiver. We, to understand the impact of the caching policies of Cordial and Quiver in importance of our training, we use a loss-based importance sampling method for both of them, and we train the ResNet 18 model on the Cypher 10 dataset. And all of these policies were allowed to cache only just 20% of the dataset. We observe that both Cordial and Quiver were only able to extend their cache utilization up to the size of the available cache. And this is because both of these policies populate the cache using random samples, and hence, they cannot exploit the uh, they cannot exploit the heat rate, uh, they cannot exploit the repetitive samples provided by important sampling. On the other hand, Shade, as it manipulates the sampling process using the PATS policy and it keeps the repeated samples in the cache, it manages to achieve a higher heat rate and thus outperforms Cordial and Quiver by 3.6 times. So Shade can exploit the data locality of samples and make the best utilization of a small cache that is, it enables fundamental cacheability of deep learning workloads. In summary, throughout the presentation, we saw how naively caching data samples does not lead to any proof, uh, does not lead to any noticeable benefits. On the other hand, Shade, which is a caching system for DL workloads, takes advantage of the fine-grained importance scores of samples to cache the samples. It provides the ability to train more on hard-to-learn samples using a combination of rank-based scores and the patch sampling policy. It retains the most important samples in the cache using the app cache. And through the utilization of these techniques, Shade increases the hit rate in the cache, leading to faster accuracy convergence and increased throughput. And thus, Shade enables the fundamental cacheability of deep learning training. Shade is open source, so feel free to try out Shade. Also check out the interesting works that we are doing at our lab, Distributed Systems and Storage Laboratory at Virginia Tech. Thank you, and I'm open to questions.